Why did Jesus come? What was, re- what was the reason for Jesus to come to this earth? He came that you might know the Father. Write that down if you're taking notes. He came that you might know the Father. He came for the word, and it's one word, and it encompasses every bit of Christianity. It's called evangelism. You can't have a church without evangelism. A church did not start until an evangelist spoke. Whether it be a man or a woman makes no difference. Evangelism is the primary foundation of the body of Christ. The Bible said he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. And those are wonderful, wonderful. They call that the ministry gifts. But none of them can operate and function unless you have someone to tell it to. Someone to receive it. And to understand that, and I'm not saying that because I've been an evangelist. I'm calling an evangelical. Well, I thank God for that. But the only way a pastor can pastor is if somebody got somebody saved so he can. The only way an apostle can go around building churches is if somebody does the work of an evangelist. Incorporated in all those ministry gifts. It's so vitally important to understand that. Now, one is not greater than the other. Because that would be a respecter of gifts. God is not a respecter of gifts or a respecter of persons. You ought to write that down. That will help you. Some, some ministers think if they're a prophet or if they're an apostle, they're higher than a pastor. Or they're higher than a teacher. Or they're higher than an evangelist, which is totally uh, erroneous. It's, totally, it's an error. Because, see, God uses the ministry gift or gifts to minister the word, his word. So Jesus came that you might know the Father. Now, I want to read this verse, Mark chapter 16, verse oh, 15. He said unto them, now it's in black, then it goes red. So these are Jesus' literal words. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. So you don't have to figure out what to do. You don't have to try to get your agenda. The agenda has been set. It's in red, so it's blinking. How many of y'all have seen a red light? It gets you your attention, doesn't it? Right. He said, go ye into the world and preach the gospel. So I don't have to try to figure out what I should do in life. And then it says to who? To every creature. Every creature. That's why I've prayed for dogs. I look at animals and I just say, Lord, bless them in the name of Jesus. Well, I've seen some dogs go, oh, Seem like they got touched. Now, you know, that sounds funny. But God said he notices a sparrow that falls. You don't think God is an environmentalist. He is. He truly is. He's very concerned about his creation. Now, go with me to John chapter 3. We're going to read the text and then we're going to get into this. John chapter 3, the most famous verse in the Bible. Verse 16, it says, for God so loved, love what? The world. Do you love the world? Or do you love the things of the world? You need to ask yourself that every day of your life. If you'll do that and put that first in your daily walk with God, you'll have a hard time sinning. Because you sin when you love the things of the world. You don't sin when you love the world. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. Love always is in partnership with giving. Write that down. Love is always in partnership with giving. Why? What makes a successful marriage is when you give yourself to each other. And no one ever comes into that circle of environment. To death do you Part. So there's a giving in understanding what love is. For God so loved the world that he gave, then he tells you what he gave. His only begotten son. Could you do that? Could you give your granddaughter for a sacrifice? Could you give your son? I'm going to be honest with you. I could not. I have not attained that yet. I haven't. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I love that. That whosoever. That's three words in one word. Who, so, and ever. He connected them. 
which means you, it encompasses everything you can think. Now, let me do a little preaching, teaching first, and then I'll get funny after a while. But whosoever believeth, oh, I love that. In him, so there's an object to believe in. Should not perish. It didn't say would not. It said should not perish, but have. And what is the greatest gift you can ever receive? A Mercedes Benz? No. Good car. A beautiful home? No. Nice. The greatest gift, and I'll deal with that in the message. Is everlasting life. Everlasting. Or lasting ever. Life. And most people stop there and doesn't realize that verse 17 is just as important as verse 16. And I wish the preaching world, the priest world, would understand this. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. How many times you went to church and got condemned? How did that happen? They were reading a genetically altered Bible. They were genetically altered to make you feel guilty. When love does not make you feel guilty, love opens your eyes to the truth. Oh Lord, I'm going to buy this tape myself. I don't have all this in my notes. I haven't got to my notes yet. People get angry at me because I will not condemn people. Who am I to think that I have the power to condemn to start with? For God not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Might. I wish he'd have said would. But if he'd have said would, then he would have taken away your will. Oh, Boy, I had a Holy Ghost coming on. I can feel it. I got goosebumps, big as oranges on my legs right now. Lord Jesus. I wish he would have said would. And at times in prayer, I'd say, why didn't you say would? Make them. He said, then... I would never know if you truly loved me. I can make you. But then I would never know if you truly would love me. Just a few days ago, I had one of my employees ask me the same question. Brother Jesse, why do you preach so much? Why do you go so much? I mean, you run high. You run constantly. Why? To meet this budget? Which is in the millions of a month. No. The title of this message is why I preach so much. I have fallen in love with the world. Not the things of the world. Now if you're going to applaud, do it right or don't do it at all. Don't patty clap. And when I kiss Kathy, I don't peck her son. I double lip lock the woman. Now you got the revelation. Okay. <laughs> I have fallen. Look at Kathy. She's my who? <laughs> I have fallen in love with the world. Yeah, but you get tired. Okay. It's very expensive. Yes. It's lonely. Yes. Sometimes you don't want to go. Yes. But it makes no difference, the country, the culture, or the climate. We preach this gospel. He said, go ye. But most people say, ye go. (laughs) They take their responsibility and place it on another. That doesn't mean you quit your job. You may not be called to the ministry gift of an evangelist or an apostle or a prophet or an evangelist, pastor or teacher. But we're all called to evangelize with the witness of who Christ is in us. That's evangelism every day of your life. So that's what moves me. 
See, a lot of ministries go out to get money. They go out to charge money. I've had people say, why haven't you charged people to come to church? Because Jesus didn't. Well, what about the budget? What about it? Did God tell you to do it? Is your budget bigger than what God said? You see, we got to change the world. I saw something yesterday. We were out, <clears throat> out eating dinner with a few friends and it was a blessing. We drove by the New Orleans Mission. Saw a lot of blankets and, you know, looked like sleeping bags and stuff out on the grass. Turned on the news last night and a lot of people were going into the New Orleans Mission, which is a worthy cause, to get people out of the cold. That's wonderful. That's religion. But here's the problem. It helps the poor. Great. But when will they change the status of the poor? Now, I'm not talking about New Orleans Mission. They're honorable. I'm talking about when will we stop poverty in the world? So the next cold spell, we're going to have more homeless. When will the homeless no longer be homeless? See, that's genetically altered Christianity that has financed poverty instead of eradicating it. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. I'm not against, I help the poor, I do it because God said to do it. That's not the issue. You want to criticize me for prosperity? I, the reason God tells us to preach prosperity is not so we can have money, so we can stop the poverty that is the greatest sickness on this planet. And yet, we canonize it. I wanted to see all those people not sleeping on the grass or under a bridge. It would be nice if we went back next year and they'd say, Oh, then we have no more homeless in New Orleans. Amen. We've eradicated poverty in our city. Not through socialism. No. Because if you pay people to be poor, they stay poor. Oh, Lord, this is good. I want to preach this so strong, but I'm holding on to this book because he said, teach this. When you fall in love with someone, you change their destiny. If you change where they are to where they should be. Is that understandable? Now write this down. Understanding the purpose of evangelism will produce compassion for others. It's a drive birthed out of love. I had compassion upon those people, but it didn't stop them from being homeless. I have to say something. I have to do something to make them say, I will not be homeless no more. I will not be sick no more. Don't shout me down. I'll not be lazy no more. I'll do whatever it takes. I heard the other day a person quit their job because they wasn't paying them enough. So it goes on the unemployment rank. Do you think unemployment is going to pay you what you're making? And here's a person's wife who's pregnant. she got to carry all this load. Let me just tell you the generation I came out of. The generation I came out of, when you married a woman, you took care of that woman. You did whatever it takes. You got to cut grass, pull weeds. I don't care about your pride. You took responsibility. You manned up. Come on, ladies, you should be shouting. I'm helping you out here. Woman shouldn't have to work unless she wants to. Ladies, y'all should have shouted like crazy right there. If you want to work, that's fine. That's wonderful. I, I believe in that. But you shouldn't have to. Why? Because your man 
That's how we say it, Brown. That's how the black people. Your name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Lord. I ought to be taking care of you. Why do you work so hard for Kathy? I'm falling in love with her. Not the thing she does sometimes, but <laughs> her. <laughs> She's trying to teach me. I saw compassion, but compassion will not stop poverty. We got to say something. Then we got to do something to energize. Because every created, every being that's created by God on this planet has something in them that is profitable to the world. We just got to touch it and bring it out of them. Mm -mm. Understand that the purpose of evangelism will produce compassion for others. It's a drive birthed out of love. Write this down. This love for mankind is a spiritual truth. That must be spiritually discerned. When you understand this, it's a spiritual truth. But if you don't spiritually discern it, it keeps things level all the time. It never rises above the problem. It's a spiritual truth that must be spiritually discerned. Evangelism. This church can only grow, not through series preaching, Corey, because that feeds people. So you can feed people. And that's wonderful. We should do that. But what we need to do is make it grow. Oh, but I'm going to let Corey do that. No, that ain't Corey's job. Corey feeds sheep. You make sheep. Sheep begat sheep. Pastor feeds them. Do you understand? That's why we ask you to volunteer. So you can make a sheep. So, the responsibility will come to the pastors of this church to feed sheep. Do you see what I'm saying? It's not done for you to like us. We're not here for you to like us. We're on a mission. To go ye. Because God so loved. Not to condemn ye. But through Christ. That the world may be one. That's what evangelism is about. Write this down. Preaching the gospel is a divine work. Oh, Lord. It changes lives and it opens ears to the truth. It's a divine work. The world and a lot of ministry have made it a lousy work. But it's truly divine. To be called by God to preach this gospel. Because it changes lives. But more than that, it opens ears to the truth. The truth of who God is. Instead of religion. As I've said many times, instead of being homiletical, and I love homiletics. Hermeneutical, and I love hermeneutics. I am Dr. Jesse Duplantis, you understand? I can preach Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Church of God, Church of God in prophecy. Ah, Lord, Lord. I can hoop it. I can whoop it. You name it. I know how to do that. But how I do it is not the divine part of it. Preachers, did you hear that? Are you still looking for somebody to praise you? Are you still looking for somebody to say, oh, you're going to bless them with your presence? Woo, this is the new year, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to me. This world's going to hell in a handbasket. The church better wake up and finish this commission. Do you hear what I'm saying? No. The divine part of it is the gospel. Not how you look. How you talk. How you can move a crowd. That's not divine. That's flesh. Preaching the gospel is a divine work. 
Now it says to every creature, every creature, how can you be prejudiced? How can you think you better than anyone else? When God said, creature, and you are a creature. But as a white creature, well, whoopee doo. As a black creature, whoopee doo. To every creature. How can you look at anyone and look down on them because of their color, nationality, creed, or culture? When that divine gospel is sin cold. I don't want to go where that's hot. Who cares about the climate? It's cold, so write this down. When the gospel is preached correctly, people hear it, receive it, and their faith rises and their perspective changes. Let me say it again. When the gospel is preached correctly, I emphasize the word correctly. People hear it and receive it and their faith rises and their perspective changes. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that I am living in New Orleans, in the suburb of New Orleans, like I'm living in heaven? And I am criticized for it daily. <laughs> People are so mad at me because I'm blessed. And I got a little bling. <laughs> ah, ah, he's stealing from the bag. I don't even know what a bag is. We don't have bags in here. <laughs> I am living. Literally living the way if Jesus came right now, I would just change locations. I'm not broke. I'm not busted. I'm not mad at nobody. <laughs> and people don't go to heaven. I'm going to be there. <laughs> don't go. We don't want your trailer in heaven. Don't shout me down when I, oh, I made you mad there, didn't I? Let me tell you, I'm trying to get you out that trailer. Ain't nothing wrong with it because you can carry it with you when a hurricane comes. But if you got enough money and your house gets tore up, it don't make a lick of difference. You come back and you rebuild it, not on insurance money, but what you got in your pocket. That's what I'm trying to tell you. When you get to heaven, you're not struggling. His will be done on earth, in earth, as it is in heaven. Mm. Mm. See, I'm just trying to help you. And you got mad right there, but that's a part of that point. Your faith rises. If your faith rises, your perspective changes. You begin to say, I can do that. I can do that. I can have that. And not feel guilty and condemned by it. We went to the show. We do go to theaters. Some people get mad about that, but that's all right. Most of them are a show in their own selves. But anyway, <clears throat> we went to the show. Several friends. We were sitting there and had a nice time. We're coming out. I think Ron and Peel were with us. Or right before we went in, and somebody come running up to me. Is that your house? <laughs> I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I saw Ron. Tell you one thing, if I wasn't saved, I'd bust your head right now, sucker. <laughs> I could see it on Ron. I said, Ron got hot. I kind of backed up and said, do your work, Ron. Just go ahead. <laughs> you hit him, you won't make the paper, but I will. <laughs> Yeah, just doing what God said. Have I wrote a letter to you and asked you to pay for my house? No. Have I asked you to give something to it? 
No. <sighs> Genetically altered. Write this down. When people need to see, or what people need to see, is more than religion. It's more than philosophical ideas. They must meet God personally. They want to meet God. They need to meet God personally. Not philosophically. Not from religion. I met God through religion all my life growing up. I, babe, you don't think I have been a variety? I have been Catholic. On nomine patria fili, or spirito santo. I have been Baptist, almost closely heavily for the God. I've been Methodist. I'm being critical. I like the Methodist. I've been Assembly of God. Full gospel. Pentecostal. People say, what religion are you? I said, pick one, man. We've been there. We've been there. None of them taught me anything. None could get me saved, much less keep me saved. Not being critical, being truthful. We want you to meet God personally through our criteria. Didn't help me. You know what helped me? A preacher who told me to go to church, but didn't tell me where. Dr. Billy Graham. On a television. And a sad, sick, disgusted individual in a hotel room in Boston, Massachusetts. With a little sweet wife. Would you please watch Billy Graham? Please, just. All right, I get, get her off my back. I'll watch this guy. <laughs> Didn't condemn me. Didn't tell me he was greater than anyone else. Just said, go to church next Sunday. He presented Christ. He had fallen in love with the world. Thank you, Dr. Graham. Yeah. Oh. Mm. When people, or what people need to see is more than religion, it's more than philosophical ideas, they must meet God personally. Now, I said this a while ago, and I want you to write it down. The most important gift to us is everlasting life. Everlasting life. The work of the gospel is to continually tell that name or tell that news, actually. Let me say it again. The most important gift to us is everlasting life. The work of the gospel is to continually tell that news. To go ye. Several people gave me books this year for Christmas, and I'm an avid reader. I have a lot of Winston Churchill's speeches. I love speeches, and I just read. I'm an avid reader. I just enjoy it. And um, uh, uh, this particular gentleman I was reading the other day said, I am a grandfather, but I really don't like it. And I thought, well, why wouldn't he like being a grandfather? I don't like his grandchildren. He said, no, I just can't seem to. I want to live long enough. I want to live so I will know my grandchildren. And they will know me. And I thought, that makes sense. But he never had no one preach to him that he could live as long as he wanted. (laughs) So what he was writing was truth from his perspective. You can't have faith for something that has not been preached to you. Faith cometh. I want more faith, but Jesse, you're not going to like what I'm going to tell you. Go to church more. Actually show up on a Wednesday night and make somebody pass out that you did. Oh, but I'm too busy. Okay. We're not going to condemn you for that. But don't get mad if you can't get what you're bleeding for. 
You see what you're looking for. And this is another sermon. I'll just give you a shot. You're looking for more quantity. You don't need quantity. You need quality. But that's another sermon. Everlasting life. Who? Write this down. It cost God everything that he valued. Let me say it again. It cost God everything he valued the most to support that love for God so loved. Why did he do that? Self-sacrifice. True self-sacrifice is the last test of love. Uh-huh. Buddy, when you want to know you really love someone, is when you sacrifice yourself or what you want to be a blessing to others. Let me say it again. Some of you are writing it down. It cost God everything he valued the most to support that love. True sacrifice is the last test of love. Mm. Mm. If you really want to find out, if people want to find out what you truly love, is what you're willing to sacrifice. Write this down. When the pain of self-sacrifice ceases, write it down. When the pain of self-sacrifice ceases, the triumph of love is complete. In other words, when you're sacrificing, there is no more pain. Love has triumphed in your life. You have now got bigger than yourself. Now you have passed the love test. Some people criticize me because of I, I am, without sounding prideful or arrogant, a man of substance. How did you? How, how, do you, how come 2008 didn't affect you? Wasn't believing for it. I had no faith. I have no faith for poverty. I have no faith for recession or depression. So since I didn't have faith for it, I could not receive it. Yeah, but the world around, I know what the world around me doing. But I'm not. I didn't want their faith. I didn't deny what was going on. I just didn't want it. But I realized that God would give me money beyond my wildest dreams if I could pass the test. And what was that test? Could I give it away? Everybody can give a dollar or two. But I'm talking some chunks now. There's a church here in the city of New Orleans that I gave $100,000 to. It was all I had. You know how long it took me to save that? It wiped out me and Kathy financially and the ministry financially. They don't know that. We walked out that church and our minds broke. But a hundred thousand dollars seed in the ground. And I thought, we did it. My, did I want to give it? No. When the Lord said, Give that on. No. They'll waste it. No. Do you love that more than you love me? Now, why did you have to say that? I passed the money test. It became so easy to give a hundred thousand dollars. I've done it so many times. I'm not bragging on that. It ain't bragging if you can do it. So I figured God would never ask me for any more. Hundred grand. So when he leaned over one time and said, Give a hundred thousand dollars also to Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Yes, sir. No problem, Kathy. Cut the check. And it wasn't just a, six months later. He said, Give me a million dollars. Jesus! Can I pass this baby? Did you have a million? Yeah. I actually got back $10 million. 
off that hundred thousand dollar suit. But wait a minute. A million is a million, baby. Just say it. Million. I said, Kathy. Lord Jesus. Can we invest a million dollars in people? Well, if you love them enough. When the pain of self-sacrifice ceases, the triumph of love is complete. We pass the money test. Now, I can't wait till I get to the billion flow. Oh, it's coming. Listen to me, world. It's coming. Hello, world. It's coming. Why? Why not? How do you know? Write this down. The gospel is a provision of peace. I now have peace concerning that. The gospel is a provision of peace. It takes the sting from trouble and the pain of sickness. Why? How can it do that? It breeds hope, joy, and blessing. Hmm. The gospel is a provision of peace. It takes the sting from trouble and the pain of sickness. It breeds hope, joy, and blessing. Yeah, but we still get sick sometimes. Right? Devil's attacking. But the gospel takes the pain from it. Well, it don't make no devil. Fight you won't devil, fight you gonna get. But then you get to a point that you get sicker. If this this not may, may not be good English. Lesser. Remember when you used to get a winter cold, spring cold, summer cold, fall cold? And you broke it down now to a winter cold. And they're trying to get you the swine flu. And you don't even like pigs. They're just trying. Now they say we got a hundred million doses. Now, I'm not telling you not to take a dose. Don't misunderstand me. That would be wrong for me to do that. But my point is, <clears throat> that's what you believe for. Hmm. See, the gospel is a provision of peace. Jesus is God's answer to man's necessity. Write it down. I had only moved from this pulpit because I'm trying to teach this thing. Jesus is God's answer to man's necessity. Why are you such a Christian, Brother Jesse? Why not be a Muslim? Why not be a Buddhist? I mean, you know, uh, you name a religion. I don't know, whatever. Why not? I just love serving somebody alive. Someone that resurrected from the dead. Someone. Oh, watch this now. I'm going to make you mad. Who became poor. That through his poverty. We might become what? 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 You see how religion genetically alters that, boy. Satan couldn't stop the words of God. So he got the church to make it religion. He couldn't stop it. Jesus is God's. I just, Jesus is God's answer to man necessity. Now. How do you live like this all the time? Write this down. Christ in us, a living power, lifts our lives above its old level. Christ in us, a living power, lifts our lives above its old level. You see, he fixes your souls from the inside. Not from the outside. Religion tries to make you change from the outside. God changes you from the inside. He lifts your life above that old level, but he fixes that soul from the inside. Because you see, when people are trying to fix your outside, that's doctrine. Women shouldn't wear makeup. You know that's of the devil.
That's not the devil. Not that women are not pretty, but they are prettier. You know, it, it, it takes great sacrifice to be pretty. It really does. Have you ever saw somebody pull their eyebrows out? Do you realize how much that hurts? You do that to a man, he hits you. So pull his eyebrow. No. <clears throat> how much that hurts? Put holes in your ears. And now you taught men how to do it. That hurts. Does it take pain to be pretty? That you actually wear a mask all day and you touch it up all day? I wonder what your skin cells will say. It says, Let, let's go down further. Maybe we can breathe. Can't breathe up here. Let's see if we can travel down maybe to our neck, past our neck so we can get some breath. <gasps> but I believe in makeup. I told Kathy don't leave home without it. Not that she's ugly, she's not, but she's prettier with it. And women have got so wonderful with makeup, now they got leg makeup. It ain't just on their face no more. You ain't no telling what's going on. You don't even know if the parts are real anymore. You have no idea. You can only speculate. If I marry this woman, what will happen the next day? Will she change? But if you have fallen in love with her, <laughs> and you wake up the next morning, and there's no makeup, you go, Oh, Jesus, I love you, Lord. Just love you. When you find out she has bad breath, this beautiful woman that you dated, you wake up that next morning, she goes, hi, honey. Oh, Jesus. And you learn real quickly, how you doing, honey? I'm doing fine. How you doing? Very good. And you both head to the bathroom so you can brush your teeth. Write this down. God in you must never be smoke or fog, but glorious, unclouded light. I hope that is what you should do in this year. That God would never be a cloud, a fog, or a mist, but unclouded light. That people would see you. Now remember, they got to see, they're going to have to see through all the things that you have before they really see who you are. And they will get mad at you for what you have. Make no excuse for the blessing of God upon your life, whether it's spiritual, physical, or financial. Makes no difference. So when someone says, why do you have that? The Lord has been gracious to me. Amen. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he hadn't been gracious to me because you hadn't been gracious to him. You see what I'm saying? You want what God wants you to have, but not willing to pay the cost. Nothing's free. Nothing in life is free. You see? So that's why I, I want to start the church and JDM off to make us understand that we're so far behind schedule with this go ye into the world. We need to teach the word of faith, teach prosperity, teach healing. We need to have series and we need to preach it. Because he who feeds leads. Amen. See, it must be. But our primary source is what God said. So even in the local arena, 
in your local job, that doesn't mean you, they tell you you can't witness on your job. That's your job. You honor that. Don't misunderstand. But see, a witness is more than just words. A witness is light. I love Star Trek. I've loved it from the day it was created. I like it. I don't know why. Space. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year mission. You know it. But I had to change it. Ministry. The final frontier. These are the voyages of the children of God. Our lifelong mission is to seek out new souls for His glory and honor. To fill new hearts with His presence and power. To teach and preach the uncompromised Word of God. To boldly go where Jesus Christ tells us to go. Live long and prosper. Standing of the trays. <laughs> Kathy bought me the uh, movie, the Star Trek. And I've heard William Shatner say it, Leonard Nimoy say it, but he never heard Jesse say it. <laughs> Our lifelong mission Amen. seek out new souls. For his glory and his honor. Fill up new hearts. With his presence and his power. Teach and preach the uncompromised word of God. Oh, I like that. To boldly go. Where Jesus Christ tells us to go. So country, climate, or culture has nothing to do with Star Trek or you. Your destiny and your destination is to go ye in the world and preach the gospel. Now, how's that done? Tomorrow on your job. Tomorrow at the grocery store. Tomorrow in your car on I-10 when you're stuck in traffic. Or if your pipes bust, to boldly go to the plumber. To let your light so shine. To hug someone that your mom and daddy said you should never hug because of the color of their skin. To be not condemning because somebody might be a little overweight. And you think you're the right size. Since when? Who knows who's the right size? We change like that all the time, especially around the holidays. Ministry, the final frontier. We're on a voyage, ladies and gentlemen, because we are the children of God. So we have destiny and destination. I expect all of you, if you'll believe with me and I'll believe with you, to get debt free this year. Can Can you start today? 2010, a year to win. Whatever it takes to do that. Discipline, dedication, commitment, whatever it takes. Some of you making New New Year's resolutions, things of that nature. Have you broke them yet? (laughs) Have you made them yet? You know the minutes you say you're going on a diet, you get hungry? (laughs) And you just ate. (laughs) The body don't like sacrifice. It just likes the results of sacrifice. Should we have the greatest loser in our church? No, because we're not losers here. You want to lose weight, you lose weight. But don't ever call yourself a loser, because you're not a loser. You cannot be a loser. You're 
genetic makeup is not to lose, but to win. In every area of your life. Let me say this and close and we'll receive our offering. This year starts 32 years of full-time ministry. But actually, on January, this is the 3rd, January the 4th in 1976, which would be like today, I preached my first message ever. And Kathy even remembered what I preached on. I did too. On Lazarus. Getting people out of dead. Unwrapping it and getting off their mummy rags of life. The church went crazy. They loved it. That pastor who's now in heaven, Brother Sidney Rayford, he said, Jesse, you're unique. God is going to send you to the world. I said, Oh, no, he ain't sending me to the world. I ain't going to the world. I am not qualified. And besides, I've traveled all this time, and I'd just like to stay home a little bit. No. If you love God too much to put your own agenda ahead of him. I said, he doesn't know me. I will put my own agenda. I am not doing this. I am not going out there. I'll preach in your church if you want me to. But you know, Brother Rafer was right. When I came face to face with myself. And I could see behind myself God saying, ministry, the final frontier. This is your voyage because you are a child of God. To seek out new souls for my glory and honor. To fill up new hearts with my presence and power. To teach and preach the uncompromised word of God. To boldly go. But Jesus Christ tells you to go. That's why it's been hard, Ron. That's evangelism. That is the killer of Satan. It destroys his work. It shuts everything down. That's why Satan does everything he can to stop you from being a light in a dark world. You make him homeless. You make him poverty stricken. Sick. On this planet. That when Jesus kicks him in the lake of fire, he's sick, disgusted, and busted. And he goes into hell for eternity. And where do we go? Oh, man. Heaven comes down. A new planet. We don't have to worry about climate control. There will be no homeless underneath the bridges. You won't have to worry about gas going up. Or hurricanes coming. It's a new world. It's already been created. It is coming. I mean, you're going to meet it. Give Jesus a hand clap. <clears throat> Come on, give him a good one. Oh, glory! <laughs> to boldly go. Jesus Christ tells us to go.